Tara, will you do it? Will you take notes? No. Come on, man. <laughs> no. Okay. I'm trying to open the Etherpad, and it's giving me this proxy server encrypt failure. So, Dave, are you going to do it remotely? I'm trying to, but you, um, I can't okay. access it for some reason. You get to have a backup person. In there yes, it would be nice. Can somebody please watch it to take anything that Dave misses? Uh, I can't access it, so I won't be able to take notes. You can't access it. <laughs> All right, so I can take notes. It's not on these oh, Got it. Please. <laughs> I mean, honestly, everyone, I mean, we're active in this work here. We can't have this meeting without minute taking, please. I mean, there'll be multiple folks in the ether chat. It's about key decisions and milestones. Yeah, I'm doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the recording, thank you, Michael Richardson. Awesome. Uh, I should have done that. I apologize. Okay. Um, remind you of the note well. Please, uh, if you're going to contribute, know your rights, privileges, and responsibilities. And please uh, treat each other with respect. And uh, we'll, we'll make better technical decisions that way. We just did the administrative tasks. And here is the first part of the agenda. Um, and the second part of the agenda, are there any agenda bashes? Okay. Uh, just Dave Fehler, um, I have to present in the room next door for 10 minutes, uh, about 45 minutes in. And since our usual rule of thumb, you don't see times up here, and that's because the things that are the most well-advanced documents, we let them run until we actually get them done because we want to ship them or whatever. So that's why you don't see times on here. So that means we reserve the right to do dynamic swapping towards the end so that the things that uh, TEEP does not directly reference um, uh, are the ones that might be done during the 10 to 15 minutes here. So for example, I have to be in the room for the firmware updates because Russ is an author. Um, whereas things like uh, MUD and MTI too does, uh, might actually move up depending on where we are after 45 minutes or so. So that, we'll do that uh, real time. Any other agenda bashes? Okay. We're going to start with suit manifest then. We did not get any slides for Hackathon. Does anyone want to share um, the results? I think it's probably all happening in TEEP. Yeah, I think from the interest of time, uh, any of the Hackathon stuff can be done in TEEP and any of the uh, actual outcomes have already I think been rolled into these slides on the various documents and stuff. So we did have several people working on suit there, uh, but there's a Hackathon report in TEEP, which Akira is gonna cover in TEEP, which kind of covers the relationship between TEEP and suit and so on. So we'll cover any of that stuff. And so we can just focus on the time here for the getting our docs done. So. All right, awesome. All right. <laughs> da dash 20. Yeah, mm -hmm. dash 20. <laughs> I did not expect it to hit 20. Uh, right, so um, there have been, sorry? Eat the mic. 21? Eat the mic. Oh, eat the mic. Oh, I don't need to, all right, I can do that now. I'm, I'm speaking. Okay, now you should be able to hear me. So, Much better. Right. Mm -hmm. um, right, so. There are mostly editorial changes in this version. There's not a lot of technical uh, churn. Uh, primarily, these are uh, coming from feedback from the, the well, I, I guess it was the list, from feedback from the list. Um, there were some things on uh, naming clarity. So what we've gone for here is to rename run to invoke because there was already a run sequence 
and the idea here is that we want to make it clear what's happening. So that was just a minor editorial naming convention. The same thing in um, common sequence versus shared sequence. The idea was that common and command get a little bit too close together. So by separating that out, um, it becomes a little bit clearer that we're saying common or shared sequence versus command sequence. You can see how there might be a little bit of overlap. Um, I've added some uh, clarifying text in a number of places. Uh, and the, uh, the, those are around run sequence when strict order is false, which is more applicable on uh, large systems than small systems. So this is not a microcontroller consideration in general. This is more of an A-class system kind of consideration. Um, the entry for suit invoke there, it wasn't clear that it contain, could contain image verification. So there's some text to explain that that's possible. Um, and the try each, which is used for some decision-making purposes, uh, doesn't, didn't have a clear explanation of what its stop conditions were. So the stop condition uh, explanation has been added. There was a minor technical change. Um, Ivan actually asked for a way to write a small payload directly without needing to have a separate payload argument. Um, and the idea behind this is if you've got something that requires, I don't know, 32 bytes, you don't necessarily want to have an entire separate hash and everything to make that work you probably just want to be able to put that small payload directly into Flash. Now that required the addition of two commands, one for a direct write and one to do a direct content check since there won't be a digest to compare against. Uh, next slide, please. So we had an IANA early review. Um, obviously we've had a previous IANA early review. Uh, this one is pretty minimal. There was one comment and that was, uh, since we have standards track ranges, do those also require uh, expert review as is the norm in the cozy style hybrid approach? And for that, I will take that to the working group. How do you think we should handle this? So my thought is that if there's a standard track document, it's gotten plenty of expert review. Okay, so um, if that's the consensus of the working group, then we need to put some text in there to give IANA that guidance. Um, does anyone see it differently? <laughs> I guess someone does. <laughs> State explicitly which registry you're talking about. The one this document creates. Diana didn't say explicitly which registry we're talking about. It's the ones defined in this document. Right. Yeah, yeah the, moment. The, the problem is that over the life of this document, the people who will do uh, standard track documents that are based on this will not be limited to the people who know what they are doing. And I say that as a designated expert on <laughs> several registers. Uh, so I actually prefer uh, the expert to be involved. Okay. I mean, the, the response of the expert can be very short. Sorry, I didn't put myself in the queue. Roman Danilio uh, as the kind of AD to share similar field experience with IANA on other documents. They have previously and collaboratively we identified some issues where it was uh, just in the standards track range and there was no DE and it would have been really helpful to have remembered and had some of that knowledge as Carson was saying when the registry was created, boy, you really should kind of think about this kind of as a gut, as a gut check. And so thinking about that the registry will endure after the working group is closed. I see a good point. Okay. I guess. Their so that, reaction that, is counter to my original reaction. So that being the case, um, should we adopt the cozy style hybrid standards plus expert review model? Sounds like. And I should comment one of those places where I was talking with Ayanna and they pointed out to me was on the cozy. Region. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we'll need to add some text to the document that explains that uh, 
there's a standards plus expert review model moving forward. Well, we, will we have to recommend, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, some individuals to um, to be those experts? Roman Danilo again, kind of by process, it would be the ISG that would choose those designated experts. But uh, I would certainly welcome recommendations. It would be great. <laughs> I, I think someone just pointed at me. Uh, that seems plausible. Okay. Um, okay. Quick. Uh, this is your last slide. Yeah. Uh, quick reminder, please, uh, if you're not currently drinking something from your soda, put a mask on. I, and this, this is the last one I have for this draft. So um, unless there's any more questions or comments, I think we can continue. Exciting. Trust domains. Oh, trust domains. Okay. And, and for the record, <clears throat> Ira mentioned, uh, commented on the chat, yeah. plus one on the recommendation. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So tr this is uh, suit must multiple trust domains. This is primarily um, in support of TEEP at the moment. There are a couple of other use cases that are important, but they haven't gotten quite as much exercise as the TEEP specific ones have. Uh, next slide, please. So just in summary, what we've got in here is three key parts. Um, we've got, um, or three key needed features rather. Um, key delegation being the first one. Um, we want to support TEEP explicitly. And then there's the use case for mutually distrustful signers. This is where two different parties own two different pieces of the system image and they don't trust each other to see, uh, to, to authorize their code. And we need a way to deliver those packages while still expressing software dependencies between them. Next slide, please. Uh, so summary of features we have, um, we have uh, CWTs for key delegation. Um, that part uh, is, is defined currently, but I'm not sure how accurate it is. So CWT experts, please have a look. If you're a CWT expert, please check that out for me. Um, in we have the unlink command, which is a specific requirement of TEEP, as well as the uninstall sequence. And then we have dependencies, which are a way of expressing um, these multiple signature scenarios. Next slide, please. So there have been a number of updates. So um, we're no longer indexing dependencies separately from components. The index, index uh, lists have been merged. This is intended to make uh, the whole thing simpler to handle. Um, it does have some significant implications. So digests of manifests are over the manifest content itself, not the envelope. But this treats the manifest envelope as a component, which means that doing an image check will digest the wrong thing. So the current implementation, or the current definition in the spec rather, just says that the way that this works is that there is uh, a test done in the image check command. Uh, the feedback from the hackathon was that perhaps it would be better to implement a separate command for this. Um, I see Ira in the queue. Uh, Brendan. You're using a highly directional mic unsuccessfully. And up to this oh. point, your your audio will not work in the recording. Okay. Is this better? Oh, yeah. Much yeah, yeah, better. No, I, I Thank can hear you. myself. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, no. I mean, I can substantially hear myself more. Is that better? All right. Is this okay? Is this working? It's okay. okay. This is okay. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, right, a, a better solution to the, the approach that we've had so far with, uh, with joining the two lists of components and uh, dependencies is to um, have a separate command for verifying the, uh, the digest of the manifest. 
And we also needed a test to determine whether or not the, the currently processing uh, component was a manifest or whether it was a uh, dependency or a, 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 an image. And the, the idea behind this is for handling batch processing. So this is where you have a, um, you're using the true variant of the index. And this is so that you can go through everything at once, giving it the same commands. Uh, the problem is we used to have a way to say, handle all the dependencies, handle all the uh, components, but now components are depend or dependencies are components. So now we need a way to split them apart. And so that's what this, uh, this test is for. Then finally, there is the process dependency uh, command. And that is of course, the, the thing that allows you to say, go and execute the command sequence that lives in the dependency. Um, we don't currently specify, or I, I think I do specify that it needs to check whether it's processing a manifest and fail if it's not. Um, it's possible that we could just not do that and have it just fail on a parse error. Um, I'm not sure I like that. I think I'd prefer it checks, uh, but I will be happy to take feedback if anyone has a specific preference. Um, the uninstall command sequence is the mechanism that TEEP is going to use, from what I understand, to say that it is time to remove all of the things that were installed by this manifest. And so that has been added in here in support of TEEP. Uh, next slide, please. I can comment on that one. Dave Taylor. Um, so not only is it usable by TEEP, but uh, the other scenario, and this is much less for constrained devices than it is for, say, uh, devices that a uh, human can uh, you know, type things into, for example. Um, the other scenario is where a local administrator wants to uh, physically on the box go on and uninstall something. And so you can do that if you already have the stuff that's in there uh, and just follow the uninstall command sequence. So that's another scenario. It would not be for constrained devices, but it's for a larger thing. So there's a TEEP scenario with done remotely, and there's the local uninstall scenario of the two. Um, OK, so for open issues, what we've got, other than what's already been talked about, um, the security consideration section is not particularly specific to this document. It's the one that was originally in the suit manifest draft. So that definitely needs to be updated. Um, so there's a bit of work left to do there. Um, the component, the, another issue raised in the hackathon was the component ID for the root manifest. Now this is an interesting problem because um, in a constrained system, this is irrelevant. If you receive a manifest, you know where to put it. You have one space to put it in, you put it there. Um, in a dependency enabled constrained device, this is still the case. There, if you receive an unsolicited manifest, there is one place for it to go. However, once you're starting to deal with devices that have multiple independent manifest trees uh, that define individual applications, um, probably this is most common when they involve trusted applications that are signed by someone else. But when we have that scenario, then there needs to be a defined place to put it. Um, and that's where the question of a component ID for the root manifest comes in, because that tells the device that's receiving it where it goes. Um, there's a slight challenge with that, which is that if we have that, there's going to be an interaction between it and the component ID that's specified for, that de for a dependency. So if you have a a, a root manifest, but doesn't matter what's in it for the current moment, but it defines component IDs for its components. Now, if one of those components is a dependency manifest, which contains a component ID, there's a contention between these two. Uh, the, the best idea for uh, the, the thing that I've come to for the moment, which may or may not be the right answer, uh, is that anything defined in a dependency component list should override whatever's in the manifest, and that's just not gonna happen. Um, there are other arguments we could make, but I think that's, so far, I th that's the one I've found the least arguments against. Hey, so uh, Dave Taylor, uh, so this is actually one of the long discussions we had at the hackathon, and Brennan summarized three choices which aren't on the slide, and so I'll no. see. <laughs> well, right. One is where, so this is where. I, I think they actually are on a following slide. Okay, then I'll wait then. Um, Right, so the, I believe I put those on a following okay, slide. We'll come back to it. Um, oh, there. Okay, yes. So there we are. Where should a dependent manifest be stored? Ah, okay. Yeah. And so there, there are 
In single image devices, as I said, this is clear. In single system configuration devices, still clear. Um, but when you have a system with multiple independent manifests, not clear. Um, so if we give dependent manifests a component ID, that solves one of our problems. But the question is, do dependencies also get to declare their own component ID? Um, I think I just ran through these choices. The, three, the third one was actually a hybrid of two of the others, so I left it out. Um, so the dependent component list would, this is the, what I'm saying I think is probably the right answer. The dependence component list overrides any declared component IDs. And the other option, of course, is that the uh, designated element of the dependence component list is concatenated with any dependency self-declared component ID. I'm a little bit worried about some of the security considerations around that one, whereas the other it seems clear to me. Uh, yeah, so to this Dave Taylor, uh, so to make it clear, the uh, thing that is the in the override case, right, the outer one gets to override where the inner one goes, That's correct, right? And yes. so the scenario is you can have one inner one, and it could in, this, I'm talk about some of the things that Fran and I talked about at Hackathon. Um, the, uh, the same dependency could actually need to be installed in multiple places on the same overall device. Okay? And so, for example, if a device has, say, multiple TEEs in it, right, then it would be exactly the same suit digest, exactly the same dependency or whatever, but you may need to install it separately in two different TEEs. And so where would you say that? You'd say that in the outer one with different component IDs with one prefix going to one TEE, one prefix going to their TEE. Right? So that's an example where the person that authors the manifest of the, of the uh, component that's the dependency doesn't know where it's going to be installed. He just creates a default list, right? But then you have to be able to override that to say it goes over in this one or it goes over in that one, okay? And so the concatenation aspect could have done that, um, but it means you have less control over the full path, right? And so the override means you have full control over exactly where you want it, and so it can be installed multiple times in the more complex devices. And so that's why, you know, I agree with that as the, uh, as the uh, proposal, and, but I just want to explain why. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you, Dave. Um, next slide, please. Just one more. Yeah. There's, it says six of seven, there should be one more. One more. Uh -huh. Oh, this is the rest of it. Yeah, okay, I think we just talked about that. Yes, okay, I think we're done. <laughs> Uh, the, the optional so, part you haven't mentioned that. Oh, before. yeah. I, the, the point is that declaring your own com component ID is optional. That's not a mandatory field in the manifest. And the idea there is that um, dependencies just omit it. Does uh, anyone? No, we're on. No. This is. This is trust management. This is trust multiple trust domains. Trust domains, right. So, does anyone disagree with the conclusion that, that uh, was just made here between Brendan and, and uh, Dave, just so that if there's any disagreement, it's, it's aired now? I'm not okay. seeing any online, and I'm not seeing any in the room. Yeah, this is the conclusion we came to at the hackathon, but wanted to present that to the working group to see if we could get to working to consensus. Exactly. On. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, it's two sleeves of your suit. Uh, before you go on to the next one, um, Brendan did ask uh, for somebody that is um, a CWT expert to be a reviewer of this one. So I just ask, is there anybody who considers themselves to be proficient in CWTs that would be willing to do a, a review for, uh, uh, for that aspect of the document? How about Karsten? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, cool, thanks. <laughs> so let it be noted in the minutes. <laughs> Just to be clear for the notes, which document are, are we referring to? That was multiple trust domains, and uh, everybody pointed at Kirsten after Hank raised his hand first, in case you're taking notes. So this is reviewers, <laughs> Re reviewers for the CWT aspect of the multiple trust domains document. Thank you. All right. 
now I can go to that one. Okay. Uh, so now we're into uh, update management. So it, just as a summary, there are uh, several extensions to suit in this uh, document. The first is uh, it currently contains a COSWID. Um, I would prefer it to contain a CORIM. Uh, it has uh, mechanisms for version comparison for uh, loosely coupled dependencies rather than ones that are coupled by digest. Uh, it's got some things on deployment constraints like timing, priority, and authorization, and a couple of commands to enable more compact encoding for setting parameters. Next slide, please. So the primary changes since v0 are uh, adding the override multiple command. The point of this is that if you've got a lot of components, this saves you two bytes each. Uh, then there's the copy parameters command, which uh, when more than one component uses the same value for a parameter, cuts down on the encoding. This is primarily important for hashes because if you copy a hash uh, in, the, in the current version of the suit manifest draft, if you copy a component from one place to another, you have to declare the hash for it more than once. And that is uh, not great for something that's supposed to be encoded small. So this is to resolve that problem and it allows copying from one component to another with a relatively uh, minimal encoding. Next slide, please. Oh, that's it. No, is that it? Uh, one, more. one more. Just waiting for it to advance. Okay, um, so there's, this is definitely not a full list of update management actions. If there's something missing that you need for a use case, please uh, let us know. Let me know, let someone know. Um, if there, uh, for, sorry, uh, version comparisons, um, there was an open question from the previous uh, meeting about whether it should be possible to use a manifest sequence number as a version comparison in a manifest. My instinct is no, because we already have a way to check. However, I have had the request for that. Um, and then that request, Dave, went strangely silent. So um, I'm not sure where we go from there. I, I don't remember exactly. <laughs> you, you need to have a full slide to create that. Okay, uh, sorry then. Um, are there any other uh, open issues that anyone's aware of? That's the first time I ever witnessed Dave have a cash miss. <laughs> <laughs> cash overflow. <laughs> Crop tail. Um, and in that Crop case, head. I think that is it. We, we do have, um, I'd be interested if anyone has review uh, or is interested in reviewing the uh, this document, I'd appreciate reviews in general, but also specifically on those two introduced new commands. Okay, this one didn't come up at the hackathon. This one didn't come up at the hackathon, but I, I have the instinct that it will at some point if I don't do it. So are you able to are you able to uh, say more about what the actual issue was, or should we just take that offline? Well, we can take it off. Okay, fine. Okay. I don't see Hannes in the room. No, I believe that Ken is going to do the firmware encryption one. Okay. Is that, oh, or is that then now? He, that's next. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Ken. Too tall. Okay, uh, Ken Takayama, uh, as a co-author of this document. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, we are still uh, improving our document. Uh, yeah, I and David Brown uh, joined as co-authors. And uh, we have some dependency on other documents. Uh, we are uh, still uh, doc, uh, discussing in COSE working group, uh, like COSE HPK and also COSE AES and uh, AES C, uh, CBC mode. Uh, and uh, as you notice, the title is changed. Uh, the software encryption with suit manifest into encrypted payloads in suit manifest. And we are still improving the text uh, in the document. And 
uh, we have a new uh, example approach to uh, deliver the integrated firmware into uh, to device. Next slide, please. Uh, simple, uh, this is old approach and I don't want to explain it. So next slide, please. Yeah, uh, this is new idea. Uh, the, uh, the manifest is uh, signed by the uh, manifest creator, you know? So the, and uh, now the encryption info is inside the manifest. So it is signed by someone. And uh, it re uh, requires, uh, if the author create the manifest, nobody can not change the manifest. So uh, it requires distribution system to create a second manifest uh, with a dependency uh, resolution uh, mechanism. And uh, so this is another story, but so I ex I'd explain it uh, later. And Yeah, uh, in this draft, uh, we do not uh, exemplify the dependency solution. So just simple one. The author creates uh, encrypted firmware and it's manifest and deliver it to the device. So next slide, please. This is the example. Could you tilt the microphone? Toward? Okay. Yeah, that yep. helps. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. <laughs> okay. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, uh, next slide, please. No. Okay. It's slow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, with this case, uh, as you notice, uh, the the uh, oh, it's so so tiny. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So the as I said, the encryption info is inside install uh, command. So this is signed by author. So the device can decrypt it with this parameter. Next slide, please. And now we are trying to export this example to multiple trust domains draft. So this is a little bit complicated uh, that the author creates a raw firmware and it's manifest and then deliver it to the distribution system. The distribution system creates uh, encrypted firmware and its manifest. So there are, there are two manifests and encrypted firmware to be sent to the device. So first of all, the distribution systems manifest contains uh, a command to fetch OSS manifest and encrypted firmware and how to decrypt it. And lastly, that uh, it triggers OSS manifest. The OSIS manifest is quite simple. So just check the validity of the uh, decrypted firmware. Maybe that's all right. Uh, we are still tackling to create uh, it and also improve our example manifest because uh, with this scenario, the, the author have to uh, trust on the distribution system because uh, the, the author have to disclosure raw firmware to this to the distribution system and also the device must trust the distribution system because to process the, uh, the manifest which is created by this distribution system uh, it requires to depend uh, uh, trust the uh, the distribution systems public key so it is uh, it introduces uh, more new uh, security considerations. So maybe we, <laughs> we have to improve these solutions. Yeah, that's all. Uh, any comments and advices are welcome. Uh, this is uh, Dave Taylor. Um, in case there's anybody that wasn't following this, one of the reasons for the rename that Ken mentioned at the beginning is that uh, TEEP uses this not just for code, but also for what TEEP calls personalization data. 
So in other words, the code itself isn't necessarily secret, but the config file or the config data around that may need to be encrypted. And so this abstracts it because it's just a payload. It's a file that could be placed or something that could be stored in storage, whether it's code or data, doesn't matter for the purpose of this. And so that was why the rename, because Teep needs it for both code and for data. Yeah, this is so <laughs> complicated. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to <laughs> explain <Yeah>. this. <laughs> That's your last slide. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can check this one. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, any questions or any concerns with the shift in direction, which is a significant one in this draft? <laughs> All right, thank you, Ken. So, uh, Brendan Morin at the mic. I, I guess the, the only thing I'd note is that we probably could revisit a more distributable version if that's something that's, uh, that's demanded from the working group. Um, and I'm not saying that we would change this draft I'm saying that there's the possibility that we could look at a um, embeddable or a not. one that doesn't use dependencies but uses a key distribution mechanism instead. We're going to change the order now because Dave just got his five minute warning to go uh, next door. So we're going to do um, <laughs> mud and then we're going to do uh, MTI while Dave's gone. Yeah, Were so you commenting just... on the last one? No, no, no. I'm doing the time machine thing again. Uh, sorry. <laughs> There was a, I, I really forgot. Um, there was this comment about you, when you have co-sweat that you wanted co-rim instead that would be preferable. That would be a blocker because it will take way longer. So yes. Accommodating for that is fine, um, but don't expect the co is basically done. So maybe if you want this done and if you want this done, maybe not wait for co-rim, but you, you know. Yeah, that, that's the reason that it still contains a co today. Okay. Um, Wait a minute. How does that affect the working group last call? This was for the uh, update management, so it ah, shouldn't be relevant. Okay. <laughs> so sorry when he jumps way <laughs> back on the agenda. I've got to follow, the, uh, got to snap the pointer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you, you could go in the etherpad and fix it. <laughs> <laughs> We're jumping, so we're to, jumping to the integration between suit and mud. Uh, next slide, please. So the, just to give a summary of what this is for anyone who hasn't looked at it before, the idea is essentially this. Uh, mud files are a mechanism that allows devices to uh, point to a URL, which contains a document that tells network infrastructure what they should and shouldn't access over their intranet and possibly over the internet. Um, what this does is provides a new reporting mechanism for those URLs. The argument here is that uh, it would be nice if your network infrastructure knew what this was and had those files available before it ever sees that device. And if you're receiving firmware updates, those access requirements can change. So having those two things coupled together, again, makes sense. Uh, further to that, some of the reporting mechanisms that were defined for MUD originally are unsecured and leaving an unsecured way of reporting security information doesn't make a lot of sense to me, at least. There was one mechanism defined that was uh, secured, but that mechanism was done through uh, device certificates. 
And while that is uh, a one way to get the job done, uh, there are other ways to do it as well. And particularly the interesting thing about this approach is that uh, it allows us to link it in with attestation as well. So you can attest the software that a device is running and using that information about the software, you can then uh, determine what network access requirements it has. Um, I've lost the slides. Um, yes, we have. Okay. I'm trying to figure out why. <laughs> so, so this is the, the, the idea behind it. Um, I, I can talk probably off of part of that first slide from memory, so I'll do my best. Uh, the, the, what we've defined in this draft is mostly just um, a mechanism to report either a URI and a signer key or a full copy of the MUD file. Um, and, and that's it. This, that is the draft in summary. There is precious little else that's there. So it's got similar benefits to certificate bindings, but it doesn't mean you need device-specific certificates. Um, it does require device fingerprinting or attestation in your network. So it's just different ways to solve the same problem um, I, with different trade-offs. Uh, next slide, please. Last slide. And also last slide. There's been very little activity on this. I don't know if just no one is interested in it, in which case maybe we don't need it. Um, there is an open issue about how we handle updating MUD files. Um, specifically, if you deliver the full text of a MUD file, does that imply it never changes? Or is there a way to override it? So that's, that's essentially the one open issue around this. Michael Richardson, um, I, I did read the document some IHFs ago. Um, so you just, I was gonna say something positive and then you just said what you just said, we're delivering the full text of the MUD file. I didn't, don't remember that ever being the case. I thought it was only the URL. There was an option to do it that way. Well, I think that's probably a silly thing. Okay. Um, um, so that probably solves your problem. Um, <laughs> don't do that. Um, but, um, so there's a document in Ops AWD, which, which uh, I think we'll finally get to working group last call this morning. Um, on once you have one securely, how do you update? And what are our reasonable update path? And you can do it relatively securely. Um, so I think that actually solves most of the problem. But uh, I think that you can deliver a unique URL per firmware. I think that's the right way to do it. Even if the, I would say it's the right way to do it, even if there's no functional changes in the firmware, okay? Just, you just say, this is the new version, and this also lets you do, because as you may know, you can also now point, there's multiple ways of doing this now, you can point to an SBOM from the MUD file. And so while that might not be, like we could do that through suit as well, but there's multiple ways of doing this. I don't think it's a terrible thing to have uh, a variety of ways of being able to tell the uh, owner operator network, this device may be vulnerable to this DBE, right? That's what we want to do. Yeah, I, so I, I'd I, say just go, I think you're done. You're getting okay. no reviews because I think you're done. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Does that mean it should go to working group last call? I'll ask that when people are through commenting. So hi, hi this is Hank. I was just, um, and um, I was writing mud files for rats back in the day, so muddy rats, they, we postponed them because uh, <laughs> um, the implementations were not there a year ago, but they are now, so we're re returning to that. So you are not explicitly uh, defining a mud file here. No. But, yeah, so um, um, isn't there a need for that? Why is that a no? Just as a nutshell. Why do I need to define a mud file if I'm just pointing a URI at it? Because maybe there are some suit specific costs. No. That's and not what this is for. Good. This is for uh, giving your so network infrastructure just information. simply for the network infrastructure. So the native, okay, that's fine. Thank you. So it sounds like the action item that, that Michael is suggesting is to remove the, the encapsulated MUD file and stick with just a URI and signer. That's what I heard. Okay. So I think we need to implement that before we do uh, working group last call. What I'm hearing is 
get that update done, then do working group last call. Should this be blocked on the, the last call of the manifest? It shouldn't complete before manifest complete. Understood. <laughs> okay. No, now we're doing MTI, last one. Oh, and I've got the wrong date on, or, oops, next slide, quick, before anyone notices. I was just gonna say on the last point, um, if if um, the timing's right, we could submit them as a bundle. It'll get bundled whether we do or not. <laughs> okay, so, the point of this draft is to ensure on interoperability with a minimal crypto suite. Now, I, I want to prefix this. I think I'm going to say this again multiple times. But the important thing here is that this is specifically for constrained node firmware update. I'm not saying anything about uh, the mandatory to implement algorithms for TEEP. I'm sure Dave has ephemerally heard me somewhere. Um, so that's, that's an important consideration in this discussion, that this is specifically for constrained node update that we're talking about these crypto suites. Um, so it's an asymmetric problem. Unlike many of the interop uh, algorithm discussions we have, What's mandatory it? to implement means something different for the author than it does for the constrained node. The important thing here is that your manifest author should be able to make a manifest for any device. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you, the manifest author should be able to make a manifest for any device. An intermediary that processes a manifest should be able to process a manifest for any device. But a device does not need to be able to process any manifest. It only needs to be able to process the manifest that's aimed at it. And if the manifest author can't work out which crypto algorithm to use for that, there are bigger problems, problems that we can solve with suit report. Um, so the, that's the, the fundamental um, consideration here in that this is an asymmetric MTI. It means something different for the author than it does for the recipient. And if we don't have appropriate choices for constrained nodes, they're just going to ignore this document. Um, that's one reason that it's been separated out of the suit manifest. The other reason is that it's likely to change over time and be obsoleted a bunch of times. Next slide, please. So the current status is we're defining four MTI algorithms. Um, they're all mandatory to implement for manifest authors and intermediaries but manifest processors are simply required to implement at least one. It's scoped specifically, as I said, to IoT firmware deployment use cases and constrained nodes at that. Uh, one of the questions I have for the working group is whether we should require all authors and intermediaries to implement the symmetric algorithm suite that's defined. I'm not sure that's a good idea. So if there's any feedback on that, maybe that's an option, and that one's not mandatory then. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Russ. Unless there's right. an answer. <laughs> I, I was thinking that if a Cypher suite is implemented, we probably want it to be one, the one in firmware encryption. And since it's already bundled there, why say anything here? I think the point was that the firmware encryption draft won't need to be obsoleted each time we change algorithms. It won't. It's got the algorithm identifiers there. You can do anything from cozy. But I'm confused. I'm, I'm, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm misunderstanding something okay. here. Okay, um, um, ask your question. Okay, so are you saying that we're defining an algorithm suite in the firmware encryption draft and therefore we don't need this? Yes. But what happens when we decide that that algorithm suite is wrong? Then there'll be another document that comes and replaces it. Or it just, you pick something else from the cozy libraries, uh, alg the algorithm registry. And as long as the code points are there, it just works. I, 
But how is that mandatory to implement? Right. If you're going to mandatory, if you're going to change the mandatory to implement, you're going to have to update the doc. Yes. That, uh, that, update which document? The firmware uh, encryption document. I think that Brendan's point is that it, that he would rather just rev this document and have all the things in one place, like we've done in IPsec. I see. Okay. So um, where we've had to define a new mode, you're still going to expect the new, say, block cipher with the same mode as a future. Yeah, that's the idea. Okay. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Um, Welcome back. Um, so you've defined four profiles. Yes. Uh, one of them is has HSS LSM. Yes. Right? Um, which I'm very enthusiastic about. Russ and I uh, had a back and forth about- LMS. <laughs> Excuse me. I, I'll never get- if, if I could have- you know, simple syllables <laughs> instead of lots of letters to say, I'll remember it. Um, Lucy in the sky with diamonds, whatever, something like that, right? Um, um, so Russ and I, I said, so who actually implements HSMs with LS? HSS LMS. See, I can't do it now, right? That's too many letters. Yeah. There, there's at least two. So you uh, told me two. Open source. Okay, yeah. you told me two. Um, one of them is defunct. I had a long conversation with Randy and... and um, Rob, okay, it's really defunct. You really can't okay. get hardware. Uh, the, the, okay, the, that the, was a third one. The, the, the Cryptech. Is the third one. Okay, so the third one. So there's one. a Cisco implementation and there's the Pi uh, HSS LMS. Okay, well, okay, so let me tell you what I, I know, Okay. all right? Um, the Cryptech one is at this point sadly defunct. Yep. Okay, the hardware is unobtainable. The, mm -hmm. the revision to it uh, got killed by pandemic and now Russian sanctions. Yep. Okay. Because the guy who did the work is there. Yep. So and they're not likely to ever get new hardware out is what I got. If they're spares, you can use it there. Mm -hmm. Other company was one in Ottawa. Correct. Who uh, surprisingly has an office three doors down from mine. There you go. You um, should be able to find them. Um, yeah, so A, of course, no one's been to that office in three years, um, but, uh, but actually I suspect no one's been to that office ever. That was a, a tax uh, office re registration for R&D credits. Uh, so I don't know any of the people I involved. I Maybe you do. You. Um, so, you know, that's interesting. Okay, they exist. And you say there's a third one, a Cisco implementation. Mm -hmm. I think that, that, I think that just the community needs assurance, yep. a feeling of, of safety that there's stuff that we can go and get that are going to be useful. Otherwise, we're going to get a lot of push, a lot more pushback. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got that already. And I would just like to see people relax and go, okay, it's all right. We can handle this. Okay. Yep. That's the point. So would you prefer to see this document revved when a more available PQC signature algorithm comes out? Uh, don't I don't want to wait for that to publish it. I was about to say. Uh, okay. But I'm happy to to rev it in whatever that period is, 18 months, two years, six years, whatever. Okay. Um, yeah, of course we should do that, right? And and if and if we obsolete one of our profiles, that's okay too, mm -hmm. because we the purpose was to get an upgrade path. That was Correct. the whole point was to get the yes. upgrade path. And I'm very, very concerned that people are not going to implement the the PQ safely one if they feel at all uh, anxious about, yep. you know, what they're going to do. They're just like, oh, it's too hard and throw up their hands, right? Yep, I, I agree with everything you said. It, is there an action item from that? Yeah, I have to introduce oh. him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And he wants uh, an introduction. <laughs> next slide, please. So these are the algorithms that are defined. Um, we've got one symmetric, one post-quantum asymmetric that's only kind of post-quantum, it's post-quantum hybrid because there are no standardized key exchange algorithms yet. Um, the classical asymmetric, uh, we've got ES-256 and EDDSA, uh, both of them with HPKE because um, that seems to be where things are headed, I think. 
Uh, they're currently listing AES GCM, but it sounds like AES CTR or AES CBC should be coming. So Not totally sure. CTR seems to be the direction at the moment. Okay, uh, so there you are. Um, so that, those are what we have on the plate at the moment. Next slide, please. There were two that were obviously missing. Um, those, there might be a need for a specialized version of EDDSA. There, I don't think there's a code point for ED25519 in COSI, um, but that's kind of an important consideration because on a constrained node, you can handle it differently. Uh, Dave here, can we go back one slide? I have a question, not a request, but it's a question. Yeah. Um, all of the MTI ones actually require encryption. Uh, that's a suite. It's a suite, yeah. If encryption, then. If encryption, then that's what you use. Okay, so you're not actually requiring all constrained devices to have encryption if all you're doing is distributing public firmware and things, right? Correct. No, that's okay. right. Okay, I think uh, right now the security considerations section says to do. I think it would be useful to uh, elaborate <laughs> on that point. Fair enough. <laughs> to do. Well, it is uh -huh. to do. Next slide, please. I mean, you can at least fill in the entire document as well as security. I mean, that's what most people do, but. Yeah, I think I probably will. Um, How about to done? I like that even better. Uh, so here's, you know, there are a couple obvious things that uh, get used a lot in IoT that are missing from that. Um, maybe they shouldn't be. Uh, I've seen at least one argument that if we're going to have EDDSA, we might as well put it Chacha Poly with it. Um, that's an option. Those, that set seems to get used together quite a lot, which is the argument for that. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that would be a good change. I don't know. Oh, I've got a thumbs up from at least one person. <laughs> okay, so uh, that, that might be one change to make. Um, and that's it. If you have any feedback, please let me know. I'd be welcome co-authors as well. If someone wants to do some of this, write security considerations maybe. <laughs> Ta-da. Ta -da. So should we do a uh, poll for adoption? How do we want to do that? Because this no, one's... I think he needs to do an, an update to address that point you made before we adopt it. Bef uh, I, oh, I, no, I mean, that... before yeah. it's adopted before we last call it. Um, no, I'm saying right now it's an individual submission. It's not a working group document. The MTI. Uh, MTI. Oh, I think you're right. I think okay. you're right. It is. And so. Um, uh, I think we have the action item to call for the adoption. So I'm asking, yeah. can we do that right now? And say, can this, it's not done, right? Yeah. Can we at least rename it from uh, individual to working group? The question is, does anyone ob object to adopting it? We'll take it to the list, but yeah. does anyone object to it in its current form? Uh, I've heard several people saying, just, just adopt as the next step, right? right? Just making sure, okay. So uh, okay. technically it's within our rights to just adopt it without asking the list, but we like to ask the list, so or ask the, the people. So the, the assumption is it will be adopted and the next version of it will actually be a draft IETF suit. Um, so when you grab it, post it as a, as a new one, unless we tell you otherwise. Okay, we will do. That sounds fine. Okay. Just wanted that minuted. <laughs> okay, didn't. and I think this is the one Dave wanted to be back for. So yep. this is a suit report. Next slide, please. So a uh, summary of what it is, the idea behind this is that you want to know what your device did when you attempted to install something or try to secure boot. Uh, so what it contains is a reference to the root manifest so that you know exactly what it was working on. Then you've got a record of each decision it takes. There are relatively few decisions in a suit manifest, so this is a small list. Uh, there is also a record of any critical information that's identified in that process. Um, this is done through the, uh, the reporting mode hint that goes with each um, suit command. That feeds into the construction of the suit report, but it is a hint. Suit uh, manifest processors are welcome to override that behavior however they see fit. Uh, the result of this, is, is this, what it gives you is the result of an, a procedure. There are, were two procedures, but since the changes to the uh, uh, suit multiple trust domains, there is now a third procedure, which is uninstall. 
Uh, invoke, in case it's not clear, is uh, equivalent to either secure boot or running the code that's in your TEE. Next slide, please. Uh, so this has a relationship to rats, and uh, we didn't quite have time to talk about it at rats, uh, but the idea here is that a verifier in rats could take all of this information and construct your device state out of it. And by using that, they're able to uh, discern information they might need to determine the, uh, the trustworthiness of the device. They can also extract the system property claims. And by extracting the system property claims, they can construct the information that would normally have gone into an attestation report. Uh, so this can be used in appraisal. And the, the one important consideration here is that this is not the kind of information that a relying party wants to get. So there is an onus that gets placed on the verifier to translate this information into more conventional EAT values. Um, it is, and so what I'm saying is it's attestation evidence, but it's probably not attestation results. Next slide, please. So there were a couple of changes. Um, I noted in the original version of this uh, draft that it's very convenient on a constrained device to do reporting through a single append only log. And if you have multiple places that you have to put data, mistakes get made, serialization is hard. What this does is it allows you to just keep appending and serializing to a log all in one go so that you don't have to do a post-processing step before you can before you can send or store your report. Uh, what I have done in this one is merged the system property claims and the suit manifest records to try and join that together to go from two logs down to one. And the mechanism for this, which is not entirely clear here, but the idea behind it is that one of these elements is a list or an array element and the other is a map element. And by doing this, a verifier that wants to extract only system property claims just takes all of the maps out of that list and it has the system property claims without having to worry about parsing anything else. Next slide, please. I've added ca suit capability reports. We talked about capability reports a number of times uh, in this working group and we never quite got to doing it but I thought that a report draft might be the place to put a report. So I've added uh, suit capability reports in here and it essentially breaks it down to the things that a, uh, an author needs to know about a suit manifest processor and it's just a list of lists of integers. It's fairly uh, simple in that respect. So, oh, and component identifiers which are not integers. So, the, so that's, that's the overall structure, um, the rough idea of what's in there. Between these things, you know what a suit manifest processor can do, modulo any ACLs that are applied by it, which you won't know from this. Uh, next slide, please. Your last one. Oh, that's my last one. Okay, well then that's it. Um, <laughs> so uh, that, if there's any feedback on that, I'd appreciate it. If you want to do a review, I'd appreciate it. Um, go ahead. Any questions, comments? Michael Dave. Dave, why don't you go first? Oh, you want me to go first? Yeah, go first. Okay. Um, so two, one question, one comment. I'll give the comment one first. Um, that I think uh, someplace we need to write down how you might carry a suit report in an EAT. Yes, so that is a big to-do yeah, on this, yeah, yeah. and I think that what it boils down to is that we need to define an EAT claim. Yeah, just there's an eat, one. Yeah, there's an EAT claim just for one. manifests, which would not be this, right? There's an EAT claim for measurements, which maybe you can squint and say it goes there, or maybe it's a new claim that's specific to suit manifests. My um, preference would be to define this as a single new yeah. EAT claim which is just a suit report. Right, that, that would be my preference as well. And Russ is also nodding. Um, as part of where that, wherever that gets written down, whether it's in this document, which would probably be my preference, but it doesn't have to be, um, should also consider answering the question of, okay, assume that your suit report has sensitive information. Do you encrypt the suit report or do you put it in an EAT and encrypt the EAT? 
Um, I suspect it's easier to say the latter because the EAT may contain other sensitive information from that device besides the suit report, in which case not having a mechanism to say encrypt the suit report uh, for use in the EAT is probably not necessary. Uh, but that's what the security considerations should, should actually discuss that, so. I uh, think there's a response coming to the mic. Okay. Uh, I do have a separate question, but I'm happy to go after Michael. Uh, so that's, this is all my first one, so. Okay. But if Hank wants to respond to this, we can cover this one in a little. So I would, not, this is Hank. I would not assume that we offload the responsibility of encrypting something to EAT, because, but that would imply that we always send suit reports in EAT. Looks weird to me. Yeah. That, to okay. yeah. I, yeah. Okay. I was not making that assumption. I was saying when sending a suit report in EAT. Right, but the implication then, 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 then is then. that what do you do when you don't? I, yes. I agree. You have to cover that too. How do you encrypt it when you yeah. don't? I, 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 I agree that you need a different mechanism when not covering it. Well, you need to also answer the question of what if it's not in EAT. I agree with that. Yeah, okay. If that's fine, then yeah, we are. Yeah. Uh, on the EAT one, if you imagine that there are uh, five different claims of which suit report is one, and all of them have sensitive information, do you encrypt five things separately and then put them in an EAT? Yeah. Or do you put them all in an EAT and encrypt the whole thing? That, that I'm saying that's the discussion that should be put into the security considerations, right? That's the discussion that you go in the EAT box. Uh, possibly, yes. Okay, so if you didn't hear that remotely, Russ said uh, that's a discussion that should go in the EAT document. Or, or yeah. So uh, Michael Richardson here. So I'm really happy I let you go first um, because because um, uh, now I can ask the, my, my question in a much uh, more interesting way. Um, so um, up to this point, we are the whole status tracker has been sort of out of scope for the working group. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how do we get suit reports back in the first place, given that we haven't even told people how to get, you know, manifests and stuff to the device that's a, all a device specific thing so how do we get any of this back and that actually the answers part of the question <laughs> huh that actually, the same way the same magic way but <laughs> yeah. but you see at that point if you say it's the same magic way then the the privacy considerations for that thing are also the same magic way right. okay so that actually is my bigger question is that i think that this document has pushed us very close to saying it's time for a small recharter to have an IETF standard status tracker with encryption that can collect this information. Okay. I have a counter proposal. That's fine. I don't care how we do it, but as long as we do it. Okay. Because otherwise I think that, that, well, there's some places, some verticals like TEEP where they have the problem solved. I think there's a whole bunch of other places where people are just, uh, Okay, and they're going to wind up in some very proprietary uh, vertical at that point. So, so I have a counter proposal. Can I tell you yeah. about it in yeah. an hour? In an hour? <laughs> yes. At some other place. Okay. So, but I'll, I'll sorry, I'm just joking. Uh, the what we've realized that there's this, that there really isn't anything in TEEP that restricts it to TEEs. There's nothing in the TEEP protocol draft that would prevent you from using it outside of a TEE. And when you squint at it just hard enough, it looks an awful lot like that status tracker. So I think that's really cool. And I think that for a bunch of things um, that are of the you know, Raspberry Pi and larger uh, devices, I think that's probably the right answer. Um, and then the question is whether that's usable below that. And that may be the case that it is. Right. And the reason I, I think that TEEs don't have that problem is that they also have a, typically a rich execution environment that can do all of the heavy networking stuff, you know, that is, you know, no longer possible on 16 bit CPUs for some reason. But anyway, I'm just kidding. Right. Obviously, it is. Right. There you go. So uh, what I'm what I'm saying is I think that it's worth exploring that, but I think that it would make sense if we already have a protocol and and, and so on that does roughly what we're talking about to evaluate it first. Okay. Um, if it's a follow-up, let Carl go first. Okay. Well, just to Russ's point um, about where encryption discussion should go, I think it should go in an EAT profile, which is where EAT right. says things should go now. Absolutely so, agree. That's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Dave Taylor, now my other question. Um, 
on the slide here, it says they're broken down into supported component identifiers, and, and you uh, pointed out that, you know, they're not integers and stuff. So what does supported component identifiers mean for a non-constrained device is my question. So there is a wild card. Does that answer your question? So you could say, here's a path, and then everything after that is a wild card where I could support arbitrary components if you choose to install them as long as it goes under this path. That's correct. Okay, Thanks. that answered my question. Thank you. Are we done? I think we're done. Just make sure. Chairs didn't quite respond to my Carter question. No, we didn't. Uh, but he's across the room. Okay, I don't remember what the charter question was. Just oh, the. On. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure we... You're right. Um, uh, on, uh, so Brendan's answer here about an hour is referring to like the TEEP meeting. Um, and uh, I will observe that earlier in the suit working group, right, we had a discussion of can you use suit for, sorry, can you use a suit manifest for things that are not IoT devices, right, because, you know, software update for uh, Internet of Things. And we said, yes, we're chartered to make sure that it works for IoT, but we actually put language in the suit manifest that said it is not restricted for that purpose, okay. Right? You can imagine a similar discussion go that might happen in TEEP. All right, so you covered. Right, you cover the hard case covered. because otherwise you wouldn't, right? And then if it happens to be usable for the easy case, go for it, right? All right, so just making sure since we jumped around the agenda, this page we covered all of them. Yeah, I, I think this page we covered all of. So we are now to the any other business. So would anyone like to raise some? Okay. Then, thank you. We're we're done early. Okay. Yep. They're probably not out yet. <laughs> thank you. I'm surprised we're done early. Mm -hmm. Well, but we definitely need more than 60 minutes, right? Absolutely. So it means, you know, we, we, we pick the right number at 90. In fact, we use 71 effectively. Yep. I don't think we had any, we, unless something happened on the phone, there was no non-essential discussion. Oh, well, we did a couple of yeah, interesting okay. things while you were next door. Okay. But, uh, so we could have put those the end and then put them on the no. I hope it went well next door. Um, it, um, my part of it did since I'm yeah. just advertising a side meeting, so. Carlos reminded me that I told him something that I should also tell you. Um, in Global Platform, there's something designed called a generic trust actor API. Okay. And what does generic mean? Generic in yet another layer. Because there's so many, <laughs> they're just added. That's extensively standard set by two or whatever. So there's. There's so I, many. I actually, I actually, I'm not 100% sure that they mean trust anchor or root of trust, which is I, I'm pretty, similar, but not they, but, 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 As they have a root of trust definition document, I'm pretty sure they actually mean trust anchor. Mm -hmm. And so they want to manage that for validation procedures, mm -hmm. of course. And, uh, and the, uh, I will propagate the TA profile for uh, Quorum. At your platform, because I have a liaison relationship with them due to CCT. That concise TA stories? Again? The concise TA stories document? They have a, uh, they have a, they have a concise. No. No, I'm saying make sure they know about our yeah. concise yeah. TA right. stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. the Quorum TA. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. They have also a cozy key store. They build a CE implemented cozy key store. And they use cozy keys as the interface messages. 
and then and the star is a TA. And that why? tells all of the, because they don't, why? So wait a minute, because then they can give AES keys and stuff too. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, they want that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if they want to be capable of supporting a lot of these. I'm worried that you, they made a footnote. 